Hey everyone, it's Dr. A, and in this video, we'll be investigating the second component of a process we refer to as cellular respiration, and the name of that process is the citric acid cycle. The best place for us to begin as we uncover the citric acid cycle is with a quick recap of the end products of its preceding series, which is glycolysis. It's here in which we ended up with two molecules of ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, two molecules of NADH, and two pyruvate molecules. Now, prior to the citric acid cycle beginning, we have a precursor step, which is called pyruvate oxidation, that takes place within the mitochondria. And it's important to note that this process occurs in the presence of sufficient levels of oxygen. And one of the things that's helpful for us to investigate Briefly, before we continue, are some of the mitochondria's components. First, we have the outer membrane, which acts as a protective barrier, regulating the structures that are allowed to enter. In general, it permits smaller molecules to enter, while larger molecules can only enter via specialized protein channels. Secondly, we have the inner membrane, which can be described as a phospholipid bilayer located inside of the mitochondria, which forms folds that we call cristae. Between the outer membrane and the inner membrane, we have the intermembrane space. And last but not least, we have the mitochondrial matrix, which is the innermost component of the mitochondria, which has a gel-like substance that contains enzymes, DNA, ribosomes, and other important molecules. So in pyruvate oxidation, we begin with our two pyruvate molecules entering the mitochondria, making their way into the mitochondrial matrix. So now, imagine that we're within the mitochondrial matrix. Another thing we'll need to make note of is that we're showcasing what happens to one of the pyruvate molecules. So with this in mind, it's important to remember that the process shown here occurs for both pyruvate molecules. Once pyruvate enters, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex acts on pyruvate and begins a series of three chemical reactions. First, we have the removal of carbon dioxide from this molecule, and following this, an oxidation reaction occurs in which there is a loss of two protons and two electrons. Of these, we'll have two electrons and one proton that combine with NAD to form NADH, which will be utilized later on in the electron transport system to generate ATP. And in case you're wondering, the remaining proton from this step stays behind in the mitochondrial matrix. So what remains from this series of chemical reactions is a two-carbon structure, which can be referred to as an acetyl group, because of its chemical structure. Next, a coenzyme A molecule attaches to it, serving as a vehicle to transport the acetyl group into the citric acid cycle, and collectively we call this newly formed structure acetyl coenzyme A. So let's start with a little bit of a recap on pyruvate oxidation. First, our pyruvate molecules enter the mitochondrial matrix. Secondly, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex acts on pyruvate and initiates a series of chemical reactions. The first of these reactions occurs with the removal of carbon dioxide from pyruvate, which is followed by the removal of two protons and two electrons from the molecule, and of these, all except one proton combine with NAD to form NADH a molecule that will be utilized later in the electron transport system to generate additional ATP. And last but not least, we have the entrance of coenzyme A, which attaches to the acetyl molecule and transports it as a vehicle so that it can enter the citric acid cycle. We can now explore this process, which is essentially a series of eight chemical reactions. First, we'll see coenzyme A detach itself from the acetyl molecule, and this frees it up to return and shuttle more acetyl groups to the citric acid cycle or to participate in other cellular processes. Now, our acetyl molecule combines with oxaloacetate, which is a four-carbon-based molecule, 
and together it makes a six carbon based molecule called citrate. And this reaction is made possible because of an enzyme known as citrate synthase. Now it's helpful to know that the citric acid cycle is continuously working to make oxaloacetate so that it is ready to combine with acetomolecules that enter the citric acid cycle. In the second step of the sequence, an enzyme named aconitase acts on our citrate molecule, causing it to undergo isomerization, which means our molecule will undergo a change in its arrangement but have the exact same chemical formula. This involves first having a molecule of water removed from citrate, and following this, a molecule of water is added back to it. And once that happens, we now call this molecule isocitrate. And now we'll have our change in the molecular arrangement. In the third step of this sequence, the enzyme isocitrate dehydrogenase acts on isocitrate, leading to the removal of two electrons and two protons, of which both electrons and one proton combine with NAD to form NADH, which again will be utilized later in the electron transport system for further ATP generation. And as it occurred last time, the remaining proton will be left behind in the mitochondrial matrix. Following this, we have the removal of carbon dioxide from isocitrate, which means instead of having a 6-carbon based molecule, we now have a 5-carbon based molecule called alpha-ketoglutarate. In the fourth step of this process, alpha-ketoglutarate undergoes the same series of events that were diagrammed in the previous step. So here, the enzyme alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase acts on alpha-ketoglutarate, leading to the removal of two protons and two electrons, of which both electrons and one proton combine with NAD to form NADH which again will be utilized later in the electron transport system for further ATP generation. And as we saw before, this process leaves one proton behind in the mitochondrial matrix. Following this, we have the removal of carbon dioxide from alpha-ketoglutarate, which means that instead of a 5-carbon-based molecule, we now have a 4-carbon-based molecule called succinyl. What's added on here, however, is that coenzyme A attaches to succinyl, and now we refer to it as succinyl coenzyme A. In step 5 of this process, the enzyme succinyl coenzyme A synthetase acts on succinyl coenzyme A. As part of this reaction, we begin with the removal of coenzyme A, and once it's removed, we have a source of energy created that can help facilitate the creation of additional energy. Specifically, this occurs by allowing an existing molecule of GDP, or guanine diphosphate, to join with a phosphate molecule, creating GTP, or guanine triphosphate. However, once GTP has been formed, a molecule of ADP removes this phosphate from GTP to create ATP. As a result, our GTP molecule reverts back to GDP. Finally, our remaining molecule is called succinate, which continues through the remaining portions of the citric acid cycle. In step 6 of this process, the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase acts on succinate, and as a result, we have the removal of two protons and two electrons, and both pairs of protons and electrons are transferred to a coenzyme called FAD, which stands for flavin adenine dinucleotide. And as they attach to FAD, it becomes FADH2, which plays a role in the creation of additional energy in the electron transport system. At the conclusion of this reaction, succinate becomes fumarate. For step 7, we have the enzyme fumarase acting on fumarate. And as this occurs, we have water that adheres to fumarate, which converts it into malate. For our final step, or step 8, we have the enzyme malate dehydrogenase acting on malate. And as this occurs, we have the removal of two electrons and two protons. And it's one proton that remains behind in the mitochondrial matrix, while both electrons and one of the protons that were removed 
are attached to NAD to become NADH. And as a result, we end up with oxaloacetate, which awaits the arrival of our acetomolecule to repeat the steps of the citric acid cycle. So let's take a moment to review the name of the substrates that are formed throughout the citric acid cycle. For the first four steps, we have the formation of citrate, followed by its transformation into isocitrate, alpha-ketoglutarate, and then succinyl coenzyme A. For the remaining steps, we have the transition into then succinate, followed by fumarate, malate, and then finally oxaloacetate. Now what we'll need to uncover are the end products of the citric acid cycle. And just as a reminder, we've been showcasing this process for one molecule of pyruvate, when in fact we had two molecules that entered. So we'll need to keep this in mind when we create our final tally. As a result of this process, we end up with 2 ATP, 6 NADH, 2 FADH2, and 4 molecules of carbon dioxide. And last but certainly not least, it's important to note that the citric acid cycle doesn't occur as a completely separate process. It's part of the larger cellular respiration pathway, and its products, NADH and FADH2, play a critical role in the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation where most ATP is generated.